Not too many people would argue with me when I say that The Wrath of Khan is the best Star Trek movie ever, but it's imperfect in the way that most human endeavors are. This is unsurprising, given that when director Nicholas Meyer was offered the film, there was shades of the motion picture, but no workable script. In fact, three different scripts had been developed. The Omega System, the Genesis Project, and the new Star Trek. So Meyer and the producer identified all the bits they liked from the scripts, and Meyer wrote his first draft of a new script in just under two weeks, titled The Undiscovered Country. Well, actually, they retitled it to The Vengeance of Khan, but then they retitled it again to The Wrath of Khan before release, so they really couldn't make up their minds. Many, many revisions followed, but time was wasting and money was tight. The script and the resulting film were of astounding quality for such a time crunch project, but in that hurry, a fair amount of dumb things did slip through the cracks. So with all that history in mind, and with our love of this film firmly established, let's have a bit of fun while we look at the 10 dumbest things that happened in Star Trek Wrath of Khan. Number 10, Reliance Weak Password. The prefix code is a good idea for thwarting a hostile takeover of a starship, but a code of only five numbers is in the range of your upper end bicycle combination lock, 90,000 possible combinations. Have you ever looked at that bank of switches Spock flips to input the code? There are only 10 switches, one per number from one to nine and zero, and each switch stays flipped after he uses it. Thus, each number can only be used once per code. This means no prefix numbers like 16 6303 or 01701, let alone 66666. This cuts down on the possible combinations by two thirds to just 27,216. Most Wi Fi passwords are harder to crack. Also, after Khan has been prefix coded and handed his ass, it's surprising that Mr. Superior Intellect doesn't figure out that this is what happens and try to locate the Enterprise's own prefix code in order to turn the tables on his old friend, Kirk. But that would have meant showing Khan is actually intelligent, not just telling us. Number nine, cadet dead meat to the bridge. With the Enterprise's bridge at the very tippy top of the ship's saucer, and with engineering in the cigar-shaped engineering secondary hall, there is no way that the bridge is en route to sickbay. So why then does the turbolift bring Scotty, carrying the mortally wounded cadet Peter Preston, to the bridge? Ever since the movie opened, fans have either been crying in outrage over this, or offering rationalizations and justifications for it. The damage caused the turbo lifts to malfunction. Uh, Scotty was so grief stricken that he blah, blah, blah. Logically, they could have had Kirk step out of the turbo lift on his way to sick bay and find Scotty with Preston in a line of wounded trying to get into sick bay. But then the audience might have been anticipating such a sight en route to McCoy, whereas the door's opening to this horror was indeed a shock. So that's the reality. It's only there for a punch in the gut dramatic effect, even though it makes zero sense. Shocking? Yeah, absolutely. Dumb? Definitely. Number eight, Kirk and Bones both blow it. The film's story forces Kirk to catch the idiot ball in order to show him as old and worn out and in desperate need to get his mojo back, which we can accept to a point, but it does go overboard in this regard and does Bones dirty in the process. Upon discovering Terrell and Chekhov on the regular one space station, Chekhov emotes, Chekhov, oh sir, it was Khan. We found him on Seti Alpha 5. He put creatures in our bodies to control our minds. McCoy, it's all right. You're safe now. Check off. They made us say lies, do things, but we beat him. We thought he controlled us, but he did not. The captain was strong. Wait a Vulcan minute, Lieutenant Commander, bad accent. And yeah, I'm also talking about me because what fun would this be if we didn't do some light teasing? But anyway, Chekhov just explicitly told them the titular space genius had put creatures in their bodies to control their minds. And what is the first reaction to this bombshell? Bones effectively says, it's all good. What? The instant Chekhov admits this, both Kirk and Bones ought to have suspected Khan was behind every word coming out of the Reliant boys' mouths. Sure, Kirk is focused on the Genesis material and finding Dr. Marcus, but he's beyond thick here. And Bones? What excuse does he have? 
What sort of doctor hears two potential patients say they had foreign creatures placed inside their bodies to control them and doesn't immediately ask how and where and examine the living crap out of them? Kirk's not the one caught with his britches down. McCoy is tripping over the metaphorical pants around his ankles. Number 7. The Inferior, Superior Intellect Con. Admiral Kirk never bothered to check on our progress. It is only the fact of my genetically engineered intellect that allowed us to survive. Much is made of Khan's intellect in the film, but he's dumb as a box of rocks throughout, let's be honest. Consider the following. Khan wants Genesis, yet tortures and kills the uncooperative Genesis team instead of sticking eels in them, or instead of taking any of the team with him when he has to leave Regula 1 in order to blow Kirk to bits. I mean, yeah, I get he's mad, but come on, he's a super genius. Next, Mr. Superior Intellect can't spot the most in plain sight code ever. Spock says hours would seem like days, and then explains the ship's status using days. 12 year olds in the audience could decode that on the fly, so why can't Khan or his crew of fellow superhuman, or Savik for that matter? Yes, Khan has activated his Ahab obsession power up, and he's phaser focused on harpooning his white whale Kirk. And granted, his monumental ego and sense of innate superiority cloud his judgment to the point where he's easily duped and goaded into chasing Kirk into a nebula where he loses most of his advantage. But, like Kirk and Bones, he gets tossed the idiot ball and never once demonstrates any real smarts. This was not always the case. In one of the scripts from which the final film screenplay was built, and before his beloved wife was fridged, there was a dialogue that indicated Khan was indeed an extra special super genius. Khan, how are system controls working? MacGyver's. Very well. Command and remote functions are all tied through computer stations. How could you have designed it so quickly? Khan, this is a sister ship of the Enterprise. The Enterprise's manuals I absorbed 14 years ago are still fresh in my mind. Not only would such a dialogue have demonstrated that Khan's an actual smarty pants, ergo a real threat, it would have made clear how 14 supermen could have run an entire spaceship, especially with 10 of them on the bridge. Number 6. Wiley Chekhov In old cartoons, characters would frequently run the same path of a steamroller about to flatten them, or stand by dumbly before getting clobbered by a car or flattened by a boulder. Chekhov effectively does this on SETI Alpha 5 upon seeing the belt buckle. Chekhov, Botany Bay. Botany Bay? Oh no, we've got to get out of here now. Damn! He knows what this means, but instead of doing the logical thing, putting his helmet on and calling for extraction, assuming he even needs a helmet to do this, he and Terrell put on their helmets, step outside, and at the sight of the 14 survivors, freeze like a bug-eyed wily e. coyote watching as a train bears down on him. By rights, Chekhov should have tried calling the ship before stepping outside. You don't stop to explain when you realize you're standing over a live grenade. You run, duck, or throw yourself on it. And even if for some plot convenient reason the comm didn't work inside the cargo containers, Chekhov should have been screaming for a beam out throughout their exit from the hatch and even as Khan's people move towards them. But from the lack of alarm exhibited by Beach and Kyle on the Reliant, it's obvious no communication of any sort was received. One can excuse Chekhov's behavior after he gets an eel in the ear, but not his costly ineptitude at this stage in the story. <sighs> it's no wonder he never made captain. Number 5. Universal Armageddon, but no rush. As David Marcus frets, as the Genesis proposal demonstrates, and as Spock and Bones' argument makes clear, the Genesis device has the potential to be a dreadful weapon if used where life already exists. We're talking about Universal Armageddon, Bones exclaims. In short, Genesis is a Manhattan project, and Kirk clearly knows what it is before revealing it to his confidants. So why is it then that everyone's so damn blasé about Carol's cry for help? Consider this. Carol calls Kirk to ask if he gave the order, and states that someone is going to take Genesis without proper authorization. Mid-conversation, her transmission is jammed at the source. This isn't garbled communications, it's deliberate. Kirk calls Starfleet Command to try and get to the bottom of things, and when he clearly doesn't get an answer to what's going on, instead of, you know, immediately calling to the bridge and ordering maximum warp to regular one, 
He meanders to Spock's quarters for a friendly chat, and then finally goes up to the bridge to order Sulu to go to warp five. Warp five. Yes, it's a minor continuity point, but in the previous film, the Enterprise zipped along to meet V'ger at warp seven without even breaking a sweat. Warp five is like a police car driving below the speed limit while rushing to an active crime scene. Kirk ought to have been court-martialed for that. I mean, come on, take things seriously, Admiral. As scripted, this would have been a better scene, as Kirk would have gone to the bridge prior to him going to see Spock. This was, however, swapped around in editing for dramatic effect, but at the cost of making Kirk appear to be not taking this whole thing as seriously as he really should. Number four, exit the eel. The influence of the baby eels is pretty shaky. How is it that Terrell and Chekhov can sit by as their shipmates, Reliance crew, are marooned on Khan's barren sand heap? Yet, later in the movie, Terrell manages to resist when Khan instructs him to shoot Kirk, a man he says he'd never met. Is Kirk really just that awesome? Eh, rank does have its privileges, I guess. Or is actively murdering someone just too much for even eel influence? Mm, no, not really, as he vaporizes an innocent civilian just moments earlier. And after Terrell phasers himself out of the narrative rather than Kirk, why is it that the Elon Chekhov's noggin chooses that precise moment to get the heck out of there? You could maybe argue semantics about what happened to its friend, Aww. but it's a little convenient, isn't it? However, for the past 40 years, fans have joked that there's another reason the beast fled. It was starving to death as Chekhov is brainless. Aww. Number three, Kirk's unfair tactical advantage. Show don't tell is a truism in film and video, and while it's not always necessary to cross every T or dot every I, sometimes a film really ought to just make a tiny bit of effort to make clear how something improbable happens to happen. Case in point, when the Enterprise first arrives at Regula 1. Spock, Regula is a Class D. It consists of various unremarkable ores, essentially a great rock in space. Kirk, Reliant could be hiding behind that rock. Spock, a distinct possibility. Then, in a classic case of technology doing whatever the plot requires at any given moment, when Kirk returns to the ship from the Genesis cave, he orders tactical and immediately a computer graphic shows him exactly where the Reliant is. Orbiting opposite them, presumably having just left the regular one station where we saw her seconds earlier. Now how come they couldn't do that before? And how can they track her through an entire planetoid now? And why does it only work one way? Why isn't Khan all, there she is, at the same instant Kirk spots where the Reliant is? And just how long has the Enterprise crew known where Reliant is? Is this how she's managed to stay out of sight? If you can't tell, I have a lot of questions. One can speculate or manufacture all sorts of rationalizations for this, like how the Enterprise was receiving telemetry from Regula One that Khan didn't know how to access. But then it gives Kirk an easy advantage instead of showing him using his smarts or his experience as a starship captain. Taking obstacles away from the protagonist diminishes his efforts. It could easily have been addressed by simply mentioning sensor damage earlier in the damage report, or by having regular one telemetry appear on the tactical display. But alas, they didn't. Number two, damn peculiar. Starfleet surely knows that the Reliant is assigned to Project Genesis. So when Kirk calls them concerning Carol's cry for help, the very first order of business should have been to call the Reliant and ask what's going on or if they know anything about it. Nothing in the film suggests that a call like this happened, or if it did, that Starfleet ever got back to Kirk about whether they could or couldn't get through. And furthermore, despite being told they are, as usual, the only ship in the quadrant, they spot the Reliant assigned to Genesis not only in their quadrant, but closing fast. As soon as Kirk calms the bridge, he's ordering to try the emergency channels, so something is already odd. The moment Spock deduces there's something weird about Reliant's excuse about their chamber's coil is overloading their comm systems, that ought to have been the last straw, but it wasn't. Now, from Carol's message earlier, Kirk knows that A, someone is trying to take Genesis, 
B, that Carol believes it's someone from Starfleet, as she said, did you give that order? And C, her transmission gets jammed at the source. So, when the Reliant shows up acting damn peculiar, even too long out of pasture Kirk should have been able to put two and two together and acted with due caution. Yeah, I know the point of Wrath of Khan is that Kirk is rusty, but given everything leading up to the moment of the ambush, his hesitation and inaction serves to not merely portray Kirk as out of practice, but as an incompetent fool, responsible for the loss of Genesis and the Enterprise damage and casualties. That's almost dumb enough to warrant being drummed out of the service. Number 1. The Genesis Defect even taking the movie on its own terms, that the Genesis planet even exists at the end is beyond absurd. The narrative makes it abundantly clear that the Genesis device is intended to be employed on an existing solid body. Why else would the Reliant be scouring space for suitable sites? Carol, Stage 3 will involve the process on a planetary scale. It is our intention to induce the Genesis device into the pre-selected area of a lifeless space body, a moon or other dead form. Yet, as the story climaxes, the Genesis device goes off inside the Reliant, which is itself within the Matara Nebula. And somehow, the Genesis wave not only turns the entire nebula's gas and dust into some different kind of matter, complete with all sorts of plant DNA, but all of this conveniently falls together into a sphere in a matter of minutes. The icing on the cake, though, is that this preposterous planet just so happened to have formed within the Goldilocks zone of a star. Star, wait, where did that star come from? Was it the one regular orbits, or did Genesis manufacture a star too? And how does that miracle planet just happen to have exactly the right angular momentum to go into orbit around that wherever it's from star? Ugh, and some fans complain that the red matter in Star Trek 2009 was dumb. But play by your own rules, movie. And those were the 10 dumbest things in Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. Do you think we missed something? Well, check out the article on our website because there's four additional dumb things listed there. Oh, and before I get any pitchforks in the comments, this is genuinely my favorite Star Trek movie and I've watched it way more times than I can count. But there's just something fun about taking a look at the media that we love and just tearing it apart. If you liked this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. And if you didn't, make sure you let me know in the comment section below how much you dislike it. If you want to keep up to date with us, you can give us a follow on various social medias at Trek Culture or at Trek Culture YT. You can also give me a follow on various social medias at Trekkie Bree. But most importantly, don't forget to live long and prosper.